right. So we got a lot going on. You guys, I cannot believe when this episode airs, there will be five days left until Election Day. Um, We are talking about political violence. I'll tell you, I feel like everybody's focused on Election Day. And I really think it's the wrong thing. I think we got to focus on what happens after Election Day. We got our first in-studio guest today. Reverend Jamal Bryant is our good brother and friend. He heard a pastor call to church the Antichrist. He has something to say about that. He had Kamala Harris in the pulpit the other day. She had on a dress. And wore a lap scarf. She had a prayer cloth? Well, yes. Oh, she what? is well so They missed the press, missed that. The other thing that I think is important for us to talk about is why are they burning up the ballot boxes? Y'all people dropping off their ballots and they setting the boxes on fire and threw some in the middle of the street. Andrew, we're going to talk about that because you know that was in your state. What you got? That's it. I'm ready to jump in. Native Land Pod is a production of iHeartRadio in partnership with Reason Choice Media. Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome home, y'all. It is episode 49 of Native Land Pod. I'm here, Angela Rye, with my co-host, Andrew Gillum what and up? Tiffany Cross. How are y'all good doing today? How are you? I'm real good. Let me just tell you what I've been you doing tell. this morning. No. Can you see? Well, the you people can't listening can't see either, so what is it? Oh, that's true. The people <laughs> listening can't see. But, well, for the people who watch the video, they can't. This says Black Voters yes. Matter. I was out hitting the block. With Black Voters Matter this morning, canvassing, knocking on doors, um, still fulfilling the birthday yes. dreams from a, from a few days compare? ago. I'm so glad I got to knock doors with y'all. You know nothing. Uh, no, you. I just mean the people that you get to talk to uh, interact oh. with. Well, you know, it was very good. It was in, it was good in part because it's always good to see folks. We met a woman named Miss Booker who was standing outside the church house. She said she got an organic garden in the back. She said, let Georgia State know that she's growing stuff in the back in case they want to okay. sponsor. She also gave Black Voters Matter a cash donation, an envelope. She said she was turning out votes. Um, it was That's beautiful. Awesome. Uh, and so, and, and they said, just so we're super clear in case the Trump folks want to come back and challenge their C3 status. She said that she, uh, they, they said they're going to donate it to the C3 wow. side of things because nobody else can take That's cash. Right. So well, see, it was a beautiful, um, morning. I'm listening. No, I was just going to explain to the audience why that matters and what C3 means and all that. Cause I'm, that's definitely not common oh. knowledge, but I don't need to interrupt. Okay. We well, it's just a nonprofit. Yeah. yeah it's a nonprofit. So, y'all, well, this is such an exciting show. Um, we have been challenged by the podcast Godfather, who is uh, Chris Morrow on our network often. Like, why don't y'all have guests? Well, y'all, it is time. We needed to bring a guest in studio to help us break down what is going on with the church mm. because there's so much happening. We had um, Erica Campbell join us uh, last week um, in Atlanta for our Spellhouse Homecoming yeah. show. And she had this to say when we started talking about the black church. I understand at the core of what abortion is, um, people calling it murder. Okay, I get that. But if Jesus was here, what would he say to a woman who had to choose? He wouldn't tell her what to choose. The Bible says I place before you life and death. So it is your choice. So if God lets me choose, how dare a government tell me what I can do with my body, even if I'm doing the wrong thing. So some people do choose to do the wrong thing. They'll stand before God, not their government. And I think that it is our job to remember that the government is not my pastor. And if you got faith, no matter what the uh, economic strategy is, God still supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. Some are already operating on a different level. So I don't uh, feel like even excluding somebody from the LGBTQ community, if we just honest about it, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this. They already go to our churches. They already sing. They're already here. So what is it that you're really talking about? And then just as a contrast, uh, there is a man who is the son of Jimmy Swaggart. If y'all mm. don't know about Jimmy Swaggart, I highly encourage the listening audience to look him up. But Donnie Swaggart had this to say about the black church and black pastors everywhere, including the one we about to introduce, had something to say about this. But today, where are the pastors? Where are the preachers? Standing up behind the sacred desk and proclaiming, hey, listen, folks, uh, we can't continue the way that we're going. Our nation cannot endure four more years of the party of Moloch. Can't do it. I can't support a party that murders babies. I can't support a party that believes in men marrying men and women marrying women. 
I can't support a party that believes in mutilating a little girls because their minds are confused over their gender. I can't support a party that doesn't believe in the word of God. Can't do it. Will not do it. I refuse. So with that, I think this is a perfect time to introduce our guest. He's a fiery preacher, a brilliant Man, I've met him when I was um, in high school. Jamal Bryant was the youth and college division director for Mm -hmm. the NAACP. Um, To watch your rise, Pastor, has been amazing. You have always been solid. I haven't known you to be anything other than a truth teller. So we are so grateful that you would join us here here today. I'm updating my Wikipedia. I made it. I'm on the podcast. (laughs) And congratulations on yours. By the way, thank you. Yes, thank you. killing it. Just as a footnote, Andrew knew my wife, my fiance, before I did. <laughs> oh, I so, know that. Yes, he wrote her a letter of recommendation. So I'm, I'm <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> we'll keep some things. Andrew, we'll what did you say in the recommendation quiet. letter? We'll keep some quiet. But she is a brilliant, <laughs> powerful, powerful preacher in her own right. Um, that sister can slang the word, uh, Bishop. You made a great yeah. choice. I'm grateful. Thank you for the endorsement. I love that so much. So we wanted to have this conversation. One, I'm just going to be honest with you. The amount of tension in the black church right now around who to vote for, around reproductive justice, around gay marriage, around racial justice, and whether or not we should even lean in or just be people of faith has been astounding to me. These are some of the things that I struggle with as a young Christian going to a Church of God in Christ church. Right. Um, and really trying to figure out where my lane was because my dad is an activist, right? right. So, like, where do, like, what is God calling us to do when it comes to, to down to faith without works is dead? We have the right to be here. We ain't asked to come, but right. we here now. So what does it look like to engage and what is the role of the church in that? I think we're looking at the post-colonial slave church mm-hmm. uh, as a lot of black churches don't want to upset the mm-hmm. mass of uh, So they are ascribing to what uh, they see on television. I want to put as a footnote is that activists like all of us mm-hmm. to be mindful that the black church in mass Never supported Dr. King. That's That's true. It split the Baptist convention. They have never been progressive. So there is no glory days. It has always been a small remnant to do it. Uh, One thing that a lot of people are missing is that uh, abortion is not on the ballot. Yeah. Well, it it is in some states. Yes, on a national uh, thing. But uh, I don't know how the the preacher who you just listened to said he can't be in a party uh, that supports a woman choosing. Uh, But he's in a party that supports banning books. He's a part of a party that uh, schools will be fined if they teach black Mm -hmm. history. He is in a party that does not want to offer affordable health care. Uh, So when you talk about pro-life, does it stop Mm. at the womb? Because this same party champions the death penalty. Uh, (laughs) This same party doesn't want to give money to Head Start programs. Uh, So you can't pick and choose what is the ethics and the morality. Uh, And so I think that the black church has got to clear its throat uh, and speak prophetically that there is an error. And uh, their candidate does not reflect of the morals that they are uh, hoisting up. I often wonder, uh, Pastor, when you when you are in community. I mean, you're you're looked at, you know, within the uh, Christian faith, and and I assume other faiths as a also masterful handler of the word. Um, you certainly um, um, uh, have, are someone who has inspired me, and I know many, many, many others along their walk. I wonder. Does this conversation around the issues that we that that uh, that uh, Angela just enumerated, whether it be LGBTQ rights, um, a woman's right to decide the future for her own body, are they new conversations within the the, the confines of the Black Church? Is it are we revisiting uh, old conversations, or is it is it so easily just kind of swept under the rug and passed by? We whisper about it. There are a couple of sermons on it, and and that's it. Have we deepened into a, a conversation, reopened a can that's already been opened, or is this our first time tuggling with this? And if so, why at the same time Kamala's a candidate for president of the United States? Yeah, I, I think there's deep seated issues. Is don't forget at its core, the gospel is controversial, yeah. and we want the gospel to be mainstream when the gospel in and to itself is designed to be countercultural. Yeah. 
Uh, it was the church that wanted to crucify Jesus. And so the hmm. issues that, that we are called to delve into, uh, John Maxwell says, if you want to be like, sell ice cream. <laughs> Uh, our responsibility is not to be masseuse, but to be chiropractors is not to make mm. people feel good, but to straighten us out so that we can stand mm. upright. And so I think that we've got to deal with the heavy lifting uh, that a lot of people don't really like Jesus. They like religion. Mm. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. What if my neighbor is LGBTQ? Yeah. Love my neighbor as myself. What if my neighbor is coming from the abortion clinic? Mm. Love my neighbor as myself. What if they're just getting paroled and can't get a job? And so those are the same neighbors we have a responsibility for. And the church has got to caution itself so it doesn't become a country club instead of being a community mm. center. Uh, Desmond Tutu said something, Tiffany, that uh, I really champion. Here's what Desmond Tutu said. At the end of every year, the, the poorest people in the community should vote to decide whether the church should stay open the next year. And if they don't have the votes, then they should close uh, because wow. they're not really making an impact. Uh, and I think that if we hold that model up to our churches, uh, then we're going to see a real glaring indictment of what it is that we're really called to Let do. Let me ask you, um, thank you for that. When you said Desmond Tutu said this, I thought you were about to toss to a soundbite. I'm like, you right at home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, let me ask you, I want to uh, pull out a bit from the, the current election because um, like, I, I don't attend a, a, a church. I don't go to church um, every Sunday. And in, in fact, I know very few people who actually do attend a, um, a, a church. Uh, just for context for our listeners and our viewers, uh, so often when you hear evangelicals or evangelicalism in the media landscape, the white is silent. There's this presumption around um, yes. race when it comes to religion, which is laughable to us, um, <laughs> but that evangelicals are specific um, to white people. When in fact, um, most people who are white and evangelicals um, have been bound to the Republican Party. They presume that because they believe in God and they are Republicans that they self-identify as evangelicals, despite never um, really going to church. So that's on their side of the aisle. On uh, the black folks, though, um, there's been a steady decline in church attendance. Um, 49% of black millennials say they rarely, if ever, uh, attend church. 46% uh, of black Gen Zers say they rarely or never attend religious service. This is all according to uh, Pew Research. Despite this decline, though, black people continue to be one of the most religious racial groups in the country. And I wonder your thoughts on that dichotomy between attending church services yet having a relationship with God. Yeah, two uh, dimensions to that, Tiffany. This is the largest demographic of black people since we've been in America who do not ascribe to organized faith in any way. The second part that that data does not disclose is that while those numbers are true of those who attend church, the lapse in that data from George Barner is that it is not showing how many young black millennials and Gen Z stream mm. church. So while they physically don't go, a lot of them watch online because, quite frankly, they don't want to drive 25 mm -hmm. minutes. They don't want to be judged for tattoos mm -hmm. and for piercings mm -hmm. and don't want to be reprimanded by the usher because they got on sunglasses and a hat. Uh, and so I think that the church has <laughs> got to remarket mm -hmm. itself because we got a great product. We just got bad wrapping paper uh, because we want to be, quote, politically corrected. You got to wear a tie in a culture that no longer wears mm -hmm. suits. Church is the only place Negroes don't even get dressed to go to court. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even get dressed for their grandmother funeral. They yeah. wearing spray paint oh, T-shirts. Uh, and so I think that we've got like to repack. Yes, yes. Yes. We got to repackage <laughs> what that means and what is the gospel's uh, amputated arm that we're not reaching uh, the masses at that level. Uh, real quick, and I don't want to belabor the point. Our generation, most of all of us, are, I guess, in the same age group. So we grew up uh, watching The Love Boat, <laughs> watching Good Times, uh, watching Fantasy the Island. The plane. This is the largest generation. Ooh, oh, you off top. Isaac is now coming up from the Lido <laughs> right. deck. Listen. <laughs> you guys know I have ADD. He yeah. sent me down a road. I was yes, going to sing come, some come on come back. back. <laughs> Listen, come on. So this, this is the largest demographic that watches unscripted television. Uh, so they're watching Black Ink, uh, Real Housewives of New York, and uh, Love Don't and Hip Hop. Don't forget Potomac. Yeah. Yes. yeah. 
I knew you were going to do it, Andrew. I knew you were going to do it. Resist the devil. We don't flee from you. Here's the the thing. You talking about my ADD. That wasn't even shade. He threw the whole palm tree. (laughs) He threw the He's whole so palm rude. tree. He uprooted the thing. <laughs> Listen, he was like saying, this is supposed to be a hot one show. Black people. Star 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 resident shade yeah. thrower. <laughs> Listen. And you should have said Atlanta, which is oh, where we no. are. Exactly. Yes. You, you, it's anyway, represented. Anyway, <laughs> yes. back to what the master yes. was saying. But the, <laughs> yes, as I was saying, <laughs> Tiffany. But I'm the glad pre- people are going to see this and know now why we exactly. cut Andrew Robbie. Crazy, y'all. He's crazy. And just oh, mean spirit. Yes. Just come on. Yes. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the preachers are doing scripted mm-hmm. messages for our unscripted generation. And so they don't come off as authentic. Um, yeah. Angela, you would know from that last election cycle, uh, nobody thought that Trump was more intelligent than Hillary. Nobody thought he had more experience. Nobody thought she he had a greater global grasp. The poll said she was more relatable. Mm-hmm. He was more relatable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that they could connect more with him, that she was overly polished. And I think that the church in a lot of ways are overly polished. Uh, to the second part of your question on white evangelicals, uh, the data is still true. The most segregated yeah. hour in America is still 11 o'clock on Sundays. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have that influential voice because more often than not, it's the white preachers who are on mm-hmm. television. True. Uh, black people is, are still on AM True. radio <laughs> Sunday, 3 to 7 p.m. Uh, and so I think that we've got to enlarge what our message is and hold them accountable. It's amazing. You only see a multicultural church when there's a white pastor. It. Why talk is that? It. No, you know what? No, no, no. I really want to. I really yeah. want to ask this question. So you talk about it being the most segregated hour. Um, again, so you guys, we've not really talked about all my holy rolling days, but we should at some point. I ain't gonna go too far down the road. But I was shocked. Yes. To know that some of the folks that I would watch on TBN, the yes. John Haggies, the yes. Rod Parsons, Parsley. yeah. Parsley? Parsley. Parsley. I don't know who Rod Parsons is, but y'all y'all got it. <laughs> yes. Like, I used to, they sounded like us. Uh, yes. Jesse Duplantis. All of them. Sounded like they us. They got black praise yeah, teams. Yes. But no black people on the trustee yeah. board. And no black interests on, on in their sermons. No. So I guess, my, I guess my question is, what do the conversations look like yeah. when you talk to white clergy, your white counterparts? Yes. Um, have you ever like had a conversation where it was like, okay, I'm done with this. I clearly need to be back in activism and I need to be running for office. We got to go to a break, but I want to answer, have you answer that question. (laughs) On the other side. On the other other side. side. So your answer, sir. The answer is let's not forget the conversation that Dr. King had with Billy Graham. And asked him, because black people are coming to your crusades and to your events and filling your stadiums, how are you not saying anything about integration? And Billy Graham said, my call is just to preach Jesus. Your call is to talk about Jesus and activism. And So he never cross-pollinated. And I think what you're saying is a lot of selective biblical criticism from white evangelicals who will champion abortion Mm -hmm. But we'll not say anything about aggressive police. Right. We'll never say anything about the prison pipeline. And so you can't uh, pick and choose what area of equality you want to do. But do you talk with. to them? Oh, they won't talk to me. So <laughs> let me let me give you let me just give you. I used to be on all of the Christian networks. I was yes! on TBN, yes! on Daystar, all of them until what happened? I didn't support Trump. This is a true story. Lying. From the moment I didn't support uh, Trump. I was effectively canceled from. Excommunicated. Yes. Wow. Oh, I, yeah. You know, it's interesting from because. From the economics. Right. Economics and when, in the church. You guys <laughs> remember when Donald Trump went before, uh, I forget whose congregation it was. Oh, it was Liberty University, I think. It was a religious school. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they asked him, and this fool got up there talking about, I want to read from two Corinthians. From two, two Corinthians. Corinthians. Yes. So yeah. it's hypocritical, I think, when we when we so hear um, about Christians. And, and, you know, Pastor, I heard you say, um, you know, they have the issue of abortion. 
Um, I, I don't call them pro-life. That's what they call themselves. Um, but they are really anti-choice yes. because even when you talk about the issue of abortion and you go to these churches, and these are oftentimes um, members of their congregation are wealthy. Even some of the pastors themselves, yes. they are wealthy. And they are out front on this issue of abortion. And so you always ask, well, how many children have you adopted? Because you're saying that's an avenue for these women. How many right. black children right. or brown children have you adopted? I'd be concerned about a black kid growing up in a space like that and they don't answer so i think the it, it is uh hypocrisy blanketed uh by really the desire for power and i i don't know that that um because there are i actually have um seen churches with black pastors um but they different they different you know they a different kind of black pastor black pastors with multi but tiffany here, like here's Clarence the underbelly the underbelly nobody deals with is more white girls have abortion than yeah. black ones. Yeah. yeah. Nobody deals with that. Uh, and the reality is they have painted this face on all of the black babies, but the reason why they're trying to safeguard it, and Andrew would have the numbers better than me, is that they see the shrinking majority. Uh, and they want to try to uh, make sure that they keep some leverage That's of it. control uh, because, as that comedian said, is uh, the Puerto Ricans going to have babies. The black, the black people are going to have the babies. We're going to have them scared. We're going to have them and go live That's at it. our grandmother's house. Uh, We're going to go and live in, on our best friend's couch. Uh, and so it is that really them trying to do some population control uh, because otherwise they want you to have the baby, but they don't want to offer prenatal care. And yeah, want you to have the baby, uh, but they're not dealing with the uh, inequitable amount, uh, Angela, you would have it, of black women who die right. on the table uh, because they're not getting the kind of support uh, that they need. And so uh, let's not just l leave it as a my myopic issue when there are a whole lot of other panoply that we got to open up. What's and your prediction? Because I, I think the point that you just made about white women is so key. And I I. So I I am hopeful that white women, a significant amount of white women, if she can cut into that 52 percent by two points. How come points, as soon as Tiff, Tiff said this, all these white women start walking you. down the stairs that I have to get me. They, they come in to get me. We got yeah. you, Tiff. I'm <laughs> coming. Oh, as no. soon as Bishop oh. Lane land. Tiff, I'm sorry. He was trying to ask I'm not scared, but I was like a parade of Let me just say, I got salt oh. and pepper. I ain't scared. Oh, oh okay. God. You didn't kiss him today. You didn't kiss him <laughs> These today. These girls stay ready. <laughs> Anywho, I think that white women will go and do the right thing this election because it's an issue that directly impacts them. You're right. Proportionally, white women have more abortions than black women. But I want to hear from you based on what you see, based on conversations with your congregation and the community, um, especially being based in Atlanta. What's your prediction for the election? Oh, I think, number one, I think the fifth, we're going to have a slumber party. I don't think that we're going to know the answer uh, that night. I don't think that we'll know till midday on the 6th. Uh, I am concerned for places like Georgia that they won't certify the yeah. election. Uh, President Trump uh, gave a tip of his hat the other day in New York uh, and said that they got a surprise, he and Speaker Johnson. Uh, and so I think that it's going to be a lot of upheaval. I think that the only way that we will have peace is if vice president wins by a landslide. Absolutely. If it is close, uh, it's, it's going to be terrible. I don't know if you all saw uh, just recently uh, President Trump posted that Pennsylvania is mm. cheating. Because yeah, he's losing. Uh, for him to say that now, week out, uh, is uh, they are already trying to put a seed plot sure. in the ground. So I'm praying uh, that it's going to be not an October surprise, but a November mm -hmm. surprise. You know, and we know that Republicans just asked the Supreme Court to block, um, uh, to block the, um, sorry, the, to block the counting of Pennsylvania provisional ballots. So they're setting it up even at the Supreme Court level. Supreme Court sided with Governor Youngkin in uh, Virginia right. on throwing out um, votes that they challenged the, these folks' citizenship on. And Tiff, I think to this point, that gets right to the heart of the political violence that you've been. Yeah. Raising on every single and episode. And I think we have a, um, a viewer question that, that takes us right to that point. I want to be sure to get them in. So let's roll that question and we'll talk about it. Good afternoon, Native Land Pod. This is Thomas and I come to you from the Dayton and Springfield, Ohio area. Um, shout out to Angela and Wilberforce. I live not too far from there. Um, so thank you for your efforts there. Um, and I work in Springfield, so I have seen the cultural... Um, implications that have happened in Springfield 
and obviously nationwide with the political discourse and cultural discourse and everything that's going on and then with the um, obviously the Madison Square Garden um, comments and everything that's happened in the, the past eight years, nine years with Donald Trump being the Republican candidate. Um, when Kamala Harris gets elected, and that's a hope of mine, uh, and I'm sure of everybody there, uh, and anybody that listens to this podcast, when she gets elected, do you think that the she will be enough to heal everything that's happened over the past uh, couple of election cycles? Uh, thanks for taking my question. Have a good day. I, he looked like he uh, um in a truck. Uh, if he a truck driver, I want to shout too, him too. out because my brother's a truck driver, as I said. So shout out to truck drivers. Um, just so our listeners and viewers know, Angela is on the board of Wilberforce. That's why he was saying thank you to Angela. Um, for are you mm-hmm, really? Mm-hmm. My grandparents met oh, at wow. Wilberforce. Oh, yeah, I did not know that. Yes, HBC yes, indeed. Uh, I'm on the board. It. It How is, long uh, you been on the it board? It is my highest honor. I've been on the board for six years. Oh, six years. Shout oh, out to wow. Wilberforce. I teach at Payne Seminary. You do? Yes. Come so on, I'm there quarterly. Get it, higher education. I love it. I want to come to you. Wait, you. The, the response as our guest Yeah, host? I think, yeah, number one, I think that um, I don't want us to put an unfair weight on mm. Vice President uh, for that responsibility. That was part of uh, the onus that was... Uh, shelved on to President yeah. Obama, uh, that he was uh, given the responsibility to heal the racial divide uh, in eight years uh, to override 300. Right. And Trump is evidence that it yeah. didn't work. Uh, so I think that she uh, is better positioned to heal the country than President Trump will. Uh, but I think that all hands have to be on deck. I was in uh, South Africa as a uh, student doing study abroad when uh, President Mandela was elected. Mm-hmm. And they had uh, something all over South Africa called the Truth mm-hmm. and Reconciliation, mm-hmm. uh, where people were able to give hearings of their experience and to discuss how they had been impacted because President Mandela was of the mind. You really can't govern in a post-apartheid culture Uh, when you still have the tremors of the impact of Mm -hmm. that trauma. And so until America really faces it, it's not going to happen. But the second level, James Cone, great to liberation theologian, said the greatest thing in America after racism is sexism. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so now we've got two different wounds that we've got to handle. Uh, And what I meant to speak to, Tiffany, the reason why uh, it is so difficult for the black church Uh, to get behind Kamala is because we have apostolic misogyny. Uh, a lot of black churches still don't let women preach. Still don't that? let women Can't leave. Comments from the uh, and so is it, it is going to be a problem. I, I haven't seen that that data, but in your experience, you found it difficult to, for the black church to back Vice President Harris. Well, it, they they wouldn't be polled. The group okay, I'm okay. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm saying life. in a lot of apostolic and Pentecostal yeah. reformations in 2024, women still can't mm-hmm. pastor. That's right. They w- still can't be ordained elders in the church, and so now this will uproot mm-hmm. their theology that you can't be a pastor, but you can be a president. Yeah. Women are not supposed to be the head, right. they say. Yeah, there they, we are. And now, and now there's a thing where, I don't know if you've heard this one, they say, well, um, making her head of the country doesn't mean that she's the head of her household. I'm like, what? The, there's oh, a yeah. lot of black Ridiculous. women who are heads of household. There's a whole, a, a whole lot of white women who are heads of household. Oh, there's some serious yeah. cognitive anyway. sort of dissidents, I think, between the membership yes. and its leadership when it comes to the black yes. church because there are things that I've heard preached about that I would never follow it is it's not necessarily turned me away That's from right. the black church as it is largely because the black church is still a place regardless of what levels you reach in society how wealthy you are how far you have to drive to get to it that prioritizes the issues that confront us by virtue of our race it's a place where our humanity wow. is still seen first and whether you're wealthy or not so wealthy there's still some shared experience there which doesn't necessarily happen for a lot of other folks in a lot of different faiths but but i think the memberships of of the church 
I agree with you, Jeff. You're, you're, you know, you're where where you were headed, which was that I think we're going to overwhelmingly be behind Kamala Harris. But uh, Pastor, you're completely right. I, I got offended in one place where they made my wife, who was introducing me, speak from a podium on the floor, whereas oh, I yes. was behind the microphone. And then when I put it together, no woman got behind the microphone. All of them mm. spoke from the floor, uh, um, yeah. uh, and that wasn't the same situation for men. I do. This is a frustration of mine. I'm curious if it plagues any of y'all, but I was having a conversation yesterday with a conservative for um, one of our uh, um, uh, support staff here for Native Land, a podcast that he runs. And the conservative a number of times evoked, well, black babies this or the black community and Chicago and Philadelphia. Da, da, da. And I want to say, you know, the only time I hear y'all's concern about black folks is in juxtaposition to how bad it is that we have it here in America. But I never hear you doing anything about it. You don't right. rise up with me at a march. You don't rise up with us on the conditions of, of, of economic parity, so on and so forth. Why is it that you seem to only name check us when it's in relationship to something negative that's going on as some provocation for me to now vote for Donald Trump? I don't know how you handle these debates. I didn't end up ultimately going there because I didn't want to, again, deepen into sort of the racial divide thing. But it's a total annoyance to me that that's the only time I seem to hear this debate. Uh, Donald Trump, his running mate, their surrogates, uh, all of us, all of them seem to name check black folks, but only yes. in, in, in comparison and to further uh, uh, um, suggest how bad things are for us. And then there's a complete abandonment of us. It, it's, a, it's selective marketing right. uh, because they don't talk about Iowa and the opioid addiction. That's right. Uh, they don't talk about uh, North Dakota and fentanyl. Uh, they're, they're not dealing with the, the level of uh, white teens in suburban centers who are committing suicide. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that we've got to enlarge the conversation uh, that is not even just a black problem or white problem, but it is reflective of an American problem. Uh, and Andrew, you best poised uh, than any of us can really sound that alarm uh, about what it is that it means. Uh, you're one of the most consequential figures for our generation uh, in one of the most critical regions. And your voice is so necessary uh, from that depth of experience that you have and wisdom uh, to really speak it and to take it on. That it ain't just in Duval, uh, but it's, it is happening, it is happening all over. Uh, and I, you, you've got to highlight it. So I, I would encourage you to go on those spaces because they not let me and Angela well, come. Well, because so. you, you brought up <laughs> fentanyl, Pastor. Or I, did, or I, did. I want to make this point about um, fentanyl because that is something that the right actually does bring up consistently um, around fentanyl. And they try to link the it with the immigration um, status. And uh, so I just want to offer some information there. The largest known group of fentanyl smugglers is actually not made of uh, immigrant um, immigrants uh, crossing the border, um, they are Americans coming through legal ports of entry. So more than 80 percent of the people sentenced for fentanyl trafficking at the southern border are U.S. citizens. And that's according to U.S. I did federal not know data, that. Uh, just so we're clear. I'm quoting you yes. Sunday. <laughs> Well, I want to. Well, I have a question for you guys because I want to stick with this theme of political violence. Um, I, you know, it's, it's my assertion. I think we're focused on the wrong thing. Like election day is going to happen. I, Angela knows. I tell her all the time she's going to win. She's going to win. She's going to win. Um, but to the viewers' question in terms of what happens next, I, I do. I am bracing myself for violence. I think violence will come in the courts. I think yes. violence will come in media. I think violence will come at the ballot box, as we've seen. And I think violence will most certainly come in the street. Angela, you and I were on the phone yesterday. We were talking about this. I was talking to my um, sister, Latasha, who, who did an Instagram uh, post on this, Latasha Brown, who runs Black Voters Matter. And you guys are saying, I don't know, it feels different um, this time. You know, this rhetoric feels I different. And I, I want you to talk about why it feels different, but I just to remind people of what has because everybody, the media made a big deal out of Madison Square Garden rally uh, with all the racism. And it's like, were you guys not paying attention the past 10 years in the media landscape? It's nothing new. I just want to uh, play some sound from one of his rallies in 2016. And this is all Nat sound that you will hear from attendees. And I'll try to talk through it uh, for the people who can't see it. Nick, let's roll that clip. You're, you're making me leave. All right, because I chose to be Fuck Islam. Fuck them. Fuck Islam. God bless Donald Trump. 
not taking the shirt off. I did. Fucking A, baby. What's your problem with Trump? The Constitution says that we need to right to wrong. Muslim is not a religion partner, it's an ideology. You don't come and talk about America when you're supporting Muslims. Good luck to you. Obama doesn't need a money. Go to the and vote for Donald Trump. I swear on Tuesday, I will go to the polls and vote for Donald Trump. Our president has divided this country so yeah. bad. Yeah. Fuck that nigga. If there's a group out there, just throw him the hell out. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. So that's a, from a rally in 2016. If you're listening and not watching, it was uh, constant scenes of violence. Um, if you didn't hear uh, some of the things they were saying, uh, they used the uh, F word, um, rhymes with rag. They said F that nigger, referring to President Obama. So I just want to punctuate the point. What we're seeing is nothing new. We have all, This has been consistent with his rally. So it was very... Um, disconcerting to me to see the media handle Madison Square Garden with shock and awe when this is what has been consistent at Trump rallies since 2015. Again, this is from 2016, almost eight years ago. So I just wonder what it is that feels different. Um, and just curious, you guys' thoughts uh, on, on the landscape. That's Angela, Andrew, uh, and, and yeah. Pastor Bryant. would love to hear from you. Let's let's go to break, and then we'll talk about what we think on it. Welcome back to the Native Lion Podcast. I'm Pastor Jamal Bryant. I'm still in shock yeah. and awe from the video yeah. we just listened to. It is uh, dizzying, but Tiffany, I think that we have really become anesthetized, mm. uh, that the bizarre has become normal, uh, that there is now no low bar. Uh, no matter what it is that happens, we've just accepted it and have gone on. Uh, it has not even lasted a full new cycle on the insults uh, against uh, Puerto Rico. It's not even uh, a blink of the eye that Dr. Phil said America doesn't need DEI because it was completely built on hard work. Uh, we're seeing it time and time again. And to our amazement as critical thinkers, people are drinking it by yeah. the gallon with a straw. Uh, to say to the comedian in New York, he was just joking. Uh, to Dr. Phil, oh, well, you know, he, he's really not a doctor. Uh, <laughs> to the president saying, oh, I don't think we even vet who speaks at the, at the microphone. Uh, and so I think that uh, places like Native Land have got to keep uh, our eyes open uh, to say that it's happening right in our midst. The fact of the matter is uh, that they can stay in an open mic yeah. that January 6th was just a festival yeah. of love. Uh, yeah. <laughs> says to us that we are in the lost episode of the Twilight Zone. Uh, and so I think that uh, we've got to keep our foot on the yeah. gas. Yeah, I, I, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go you got to, she wanted you to express sort of um, what feels different, yeah, I think. Yeah, what feels different. Yeah, what feels different to me is I think that although we know that they were boldly saying violent things, being extraordinarily racist, despite people shock and awe that racism was a name that we could throw out at Donald Trump, not just from 2016, but from his history of birtherism, refusing to rent to black people and the full page as he took out on, on the Central Park Five. I think what felt different is they said it uh, in the crowd. They said it outside of the building. Um, there were uh, dog whistles that I think became foghorns. But I think this time what was different to me is it was in New York on a mic, joke after joke after j or jokes that weren't funny. Yeah. Um, you know, calling Puerto Rico an island of garbage, saying watermelon. That, yeah, I was I was getting there. He had, <laughs> yeah. he had another one for Latinos saying, you know, they don't pull out just like they don't do in our country. It just just vile and disgusting. Um, no, jokes, what they think. right? Um, in quote, and it wasn't just the right, comedian; no, I'm it was everybody who took the podium. Yeah, at Madison camouflaged. Square Garden. 
Yeah. And and it was all of the folks in the crowd who laughed, who agreed. Some folks groaned, but they didn't leave, right? I yeah. think that that felt very different to me. It feels this time like they're even bolder with it. To your point, um, Pastor, where you said that, you know, um, Donald Trump says we have a surprise for you, me and Speaker Johnson. Yeah. That is bolder, you know, than he has been before. This man has been indicted for this. Yeah. Right. And now he's like, let me get back on here and say, yeah, we really going to take this thing. They're going to try to take it from us, but we're going to get bolder with it. Not not is it that he's just bold at the mic. And bold with a, a, a an alleged comedian. They're also bold with the Supreme Court challenges. There was a time where there was a respected window. Um, I think it's days. a 90 day period where you do not challenge what's happening mm. in the voting booth. They like the hell with that. The Supreme Court yeah. is on our side anyway. Let's and go. the Supreme Court has ruled in their favor. That is the very thing that I think we've been most afraid yeah. of on this podcast. So it does feel remarkably different to the point. It does. It feels like it has Andrew, to be a though, I, I, to I your, wanted to hear your, your thoughts, your thoughts but I, I just... I would just punctuate, Angela. They were saying those same things at the microphone then. Donald Trump himself. Well, yeah. I didn't see it but in that, the video. I, that's my point. Like, we, it's so now, much coming at us that we literally forget. We to can't your, comprehend To your it. point. You know? Yeah. It, to yeah. your point, Tiffany, that on political violence, psychologists would say there are seven different forms of abuse, and we only focus on physical we don't deal with verbal abuse. We don't deal with emotional abuse. We don't deal with financial abuse. And so what we're seeing is sophisticated racism. Uh, they're not burning crosses in front of the church anymore. Uh, they're redlining the zip code around the church. Uh, they're doing uh, gentrification at a high velocity uh, speed. They're uh, really uh, changing the laws. Uh, if we're listening intently, that if you teach black history, your school will lose yeah. funding. Mm -hmm. That's what he's uh, so, ballot boxes. I, I think that the yes, the violence that you're speaking of is happening and we're getting punched in the chest and uh, have a fractured rib cage and got black eyes and don't don't notice it because we putting on Mac lipstick on time. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, but the abuse is a whole lot more intense than what it was. 50 Pastor, years you're, ago. you're so right around the way in which um, <clears throat> the violence is being delivered. It's more palatable in some forms and less palatable in others. The video that we that, that Tiffany Q obviously is overt, out loud. No one can shrug and turn their eyes away from the fact that it's it is exactly what what it looks like. But in a state like Florida and Florida is not alone, it's multiplied, you know, by the tens in other states all across the, the traditional south of the U.S. You've got governors who have already uh, put into place policies that uh, uh, extract uh, the teaching of black history out of curriculum. Uh, they've already changed uh, what, it, what kind of information is contained on, on tests, statewide tests that kids are taking every single year to again, extricate um, the truth of American history out of it, from it, and then to, of course, rip those books off the shelves with no penalty to face, no penalty to be faced. But because it's being delivered by a governor who wears a suit or a, 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 a nice um, a dress with a flower on top of it, that somehow it is um, appropriate. And not only appropriate, but right for the times, reflective of our political environment, reflective of, the, by and large, the cultural center at the time. All those things, they're happening already. You said, you know, Mac lipstick on a pig, but that's exactly the form in which it's taken. And I say all that to say that this is not just a problem or a party of Donald Trump. You can remove him if you want. I hope we do so successfully throughout this, uh, you know, in this election cycle by soundly and roundly defeating him. But his policies, what he is advancing, what he's talking about, he's just a, you know, he's just a messier spokesperson. But the truth is, is that this is what they believe. This is who they are. These are the policies that they are advancing in our states all across the country. They're no different. And that's what I hope, you know, to the earlier question of will uh, Kamala have to, you know, be, be the right person to sort of get us past our, our our divides. Well, it takes two partners. It takes more than her. There's got to be willing participants yes. opposite her on the other side. And yeah. when you got the Speaker of the House who's trading secrets of Donald Trump, likely about how it is that they want to steal this election, you got Mitch McConnell who is about to be outgoing leader. But while he was there, he stole a U.S. Supreme Court seat and mm -hmm. aided Republicans in taking over the court. So so. I'm I am 
I'm less dreary about the outcome of the election at this point in time, because I think we will do what we need to do to deliver at least Kamala uh, Harris into the presidency. But I'm 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 not terrified about the violence and the forms that it may take. I'm terrified about what the next four years are going to look like in the states and even at the federal level where they're going to continue to produce this very disruptive and harmful agenda to our communities. And they're going to do it and it won't get the attention that Donald Trump is getting because it's going to be delivered in a pretty package with a bow rather than, you know, chaotically and with violence and all the other stuff that makes us all in polite society clutch pearls. I don't believe that that's the way it's going to happen, but I think that's going to be the most detrimental part. It, It is the last opportunity for the black church and our traditional civil rights organizations Mm -hmm. to prove themselves. Andrew, Uh, I know that's your computer (laughs) name. I know it is. It's not It's It's not not any of us. It could be somebody on the production and you don't know it. I don't know. (laughs) Thumb is dinging. Anyway, so here's the thing that I also wanted to put on y'all's radar that's making me nervous. So we know that there have been ballot boxes set on fire in Arizona, in my home state of Washington, and in Oregon. Um, some folks are saying that those and, and articles are saying not just um, the people are saying, but articles are saying that there have been association with Gaza protesters, free Gaza associated with those ballot boxes burning. But there was also some ballots found in the middle of the street. Andrew yeah. and Tiff, I said that to y'all and I was like trigger warning because I, I tell Pastor, I tell Andrew all the time, like, I don't know who's more frustrated about that alleged election loss. <laughs> In 2018, me or Andrew, because it's stuff like this that happens in Florida. So they find these ballots in the middle of the street and this man turns them in to the police station. There's a sealed bag and a sealed box. He takes them into um, the police station yesterday. They said that they're fine. They certified them. They're good. But what like what are they doing? They're just dropping off ballots and like that's violent. I don't know what I believe anymore on all this, all that. I mean. Verification, what do you mean? verify, verify, verify. Yeah, I mean, I, even I, in eighteen, I, yeah. even in eighteen, we had you know issues. Uh, um, there were ballots they refused well, to count that were in the if post you all office. May remember, still. there was a bomber, and he was sending bombs through the mail into Florida in twenty eighteen, which yep. then slowed down in counties like Broward and Miami Dade, largely targeting yep. black um, post offices and Palm Beach County, black post offices, or at least where patrons, where the majority of patrons tend to be black, and it halted the delivery of mail because they bought in an additional level of security screening so that these employees wouldn't be opening uh, uh, this mail and some explosion happens. And um, unfortunately, some of the opening of that mail drug on beyond the point of certification. Uh, and so thousands all of, of that. Ballots, so, to be clear. so they know how to disrupt elections. There's no doubt about it. They know how to do it. The lack of certifications, the only good news I have to think about the certification process is that in a lot of these places where they're refusing certification, the precincts are actually majority Republican precincts. Mm -hmm. And so the nullification of the vote is actually the nullification of their votes. You can't go to a black precinct unless you live in that precinct and be uh, on the certification board there. You must be a voting member in that precinct in order to certify so or to refuse certification. So. The good, I, I think, just like they did injury to themselves in the midterm elections after 2020, Donald Trump telling people not to mail in ballots cost them. They're they're creating unreliability of the system, saying elections are being stolen, actually depressed their turnout. Black folks have, have persisted through this before. Yeah, that's and that's the thing. Like, I think that we have to acknowledge, like, one, this is one place where I disagree with you slightly on the nuance. I don't think it's a good idea to have anybody believing that elections aren't reliable and that we can't we can't count on the vote. I think it is also frustrating that there are places that are predominantly black where our votes are constantly challenged, tried, suppressed. And even when you look at what the the Supreme Court's involvement yeah. in this they are the same ones that have um, de- essentially got rid of, gutted Section right. Five and Section Four of the Voting Rights Act, and um, take took the teeth out of Section Two. So now, right before, literally, we're by the time our episode airs, we're going to be five days out, Pastor. 
Now it is these these people who we say are not citizens in Virginia. Their ballots don't count. You can. That's a that's voter right. purge. Yeah. That's a purging that's right. of the rolls Textbook. right before Election Day. That is Agreed. violative. Yeah. When you talk about what's happening in Pennsylvania, to be clear, Joe Biden only won Pennsylvania by 80,000 votes. Them saying that provisional ballots cannot get counted um, regardless of if a mail-in ballot is counted is an affront to democracy. Agreed. It really, Agreed. really is. And I think no matter what side of the aisle st- you stand on, you guys, I don't know if our listeners know this. The Voting Rights Act and every single reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act until Barack Obama became president was a bipartisan vote. It was very rare for a Republican to vote against the Voting Rights Act reauthorization. Even in 1965, there were a handful of folks that voted against it. You know, I ain't got the exact numbers, but look it up, Ted. Fact check me. That is for sure. (laughs) But now all of a sudden, when black people can get to the top of the ballot, now all of a sudden we got all these voting challenges and concerns and we need voter ID and early voting days. We can't have them that long. And you want to be vote absentee. Why are you voting absentee? And we want to make sure that you're actually a citizen. We want to make you prove that you're worthy of the vote, despite the fact that your ancestors died for this right. It is it is a major problem. It needs to be confronted. And I don't think we should be looking at this at a partisan level at all. It is politically violent on all sides to try to discount and and um, deter people from believing in a democracy. The yes is fragile. The yes in many ways is fractured, but it is not broken and it can be I perfected. Think- didn't mean to be good in that so bad. No, but I, mean, I think um, just like factually speaking, that is a consistent problem that was so baked into the media that it wasn't even covered. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about this a lot on yeah. the show, but um, in Detroit in 2016, uh, more than 80 voting machines um, malfunctioned, which resulted in discrepancies in 59 percent of the precincts. I mean, these are these are actual wow. infrastructure issues. I didn't even remember because that it too. wasn't covered. It simply was not covered yeah. by by, um, th- by the press, unfortunately. And speaking of, I do want to get in another viewer question um, because someone has a, a question talking about that, uh, the media. So um, let's roll that and then we can talk about it on the other side. I think we can get it in before a break. Hey, Native Land Pod. It's Leah here. First of all, thank you so much for the platform. I love listening to y'all every single week. My question is actually about post-election, but before you come for me, Angela, I voted already and I've been telling everybody I know and love to vote. But I feel like a lot of people in my community and a lot of friends feel like once the president is in office, we do not hear from them again. Um, Tiffany also talked about how legacy media is declining. The views are not what they used to be and the journalism um, isn't just for what it feels like for us right now can be trustworthy. Um, I also own and operate two publishing companies. So I guess my question to you is what can us as people who are building media companies be doing to drive this link? And how can we keep the momentum going? Because so many people are more civically engaged than they ever have been. um, And I don't want that to fall off once the president goes into office. So let me know, curious to hear your thoughts. It's giving maybe like a newsletter from our president. Like I would subscribe to that because what are the Asana tasks? What are we doing on a weekly, monthly and quarterly basis? Thank you so much. Love y'all. Uh, I love that uh, question and I love her I voted sticker and we will have an answer for her on the other side of this break so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Native Land Pod. Yes. <laughs> I think we all, we all, I think she had a few questions in there and we all probably have something um, yeah. to say about it. Uh, I'll just quickly say about the media because she's saying she's building a publishing company. I would need to know more about it to see if it's actual, you know, journalism. Are you book publishing? Like, what does that mean? But I would just say for the media, I, every week I feel like I'm complaining and moaning about something in the media. But I, honestly, just the, it is beyond a broken landscape at this point. It is utterly uh, ridiculous. And I already talked about the way the media covered this Madison Square Garden um, rally. But I keep p- punctuating the point of newsroom diversity. You know, there still seems to be an effort in this country to center the comfort of white folks. And not even just white folks, 
older conservative white folks, a shrinking demographic in this country. Um, when you look at the print landscape, when you look at the media narrative, voter suppression was so baked into the cake in every story pre-2016. Uh, we're just now barely scratching the surface on voter suppression. The same way, Angela, that you were saying, oh, I didn't even know about Detroit. Most people didn't know about Detroit because it wasn't covered. If something like that happened with Harvard College admissions, it would have been breaking news. If something like that happened with Target losing that many uh, members information it would have been breaking news. But because it was voting in a predominantly black neighborhood, people did not pay much attention to it and it simply was not covered. So I think the more the media continues to uh, center a shrinking demographic, the more they will see their viewership shrink. And we have to be wise about where we spend our time, our energy, our dollars. We have to be wise when it comes to misinformation and disinformation. So be careful and share responsibly, but also be wise about um, what you're watching. You know, Angela, we talk about having anxiety and I'm like, I think it's a intentional effort of the press to keep us anxious about this election because they want you to keep tuning in. I find when I don't watch the news, when I'm just reading things that are uh, politically edifying, <laughs> that are informative, my anxiety goes way down. But I do like her question about how to stay engaged. So I'm curious what you might tell um, young people, uh, Angela and Andrew, who there is this momentum around presidential elections. And then when it's over, you know, what, what, what happens? Where does that excitement go? What can they be doing with their time and energy? I love this question for Andrew. And I love this uh, question for Pastor Bryant, since he was over the youth in college division. <laughs> what about the youth, Pastor? Yes. I, I think that one of the things that we've not dealt with uh, in uh, this episode is don't forget the bottom of the ticket. Mm. Folks, I don't want all yeah. of our focus to just be yeah. on top. Uh, there's a whole lot that is at stake. Uh, Johnson will only be in place uh, if we don't go out and vote. Uh, we've got uh, the capacity uh, to flip four or five uh, seats uh, in the House, and those are going to be critical for the certification of the election, as well as most of our public schools no longer have civic class. There are things people think that the president has yeah, authority right. over uh, that doesn't, and we find out all of us on social media, people are asking what the vice president did or did not do uh, because they don't understand what are the boundaries of the power of the vice president. Uh, Richard Niebuhr, old uh, theologian, said politicians can only do what the people allow them to do. Uh, and so I think that is part of our responsibility is to hold them accountable uh, and to really underscore what is our ask. Power concedes nothing without a demand. If you don't ask for anything, you won't receive anything. Andrew, what about you? You started the Young Elected Officials Network. You were elected right out of FAMU um, as, a, as a commissioner in Tallahassee. What, like, what are the ways to stay engaged? You ran yeah. for office to stay engaged. Well, one, one thing following you, uh, Pastor Brian, I appreciate you mentioning voting the whole ballot. Um, uh, I wanna, one, I want to devil down. Please, please, please vote your entire ballot. But I also want to say for voters, one of the things that's been turning some of the younger voters out and low information voters off is that they don't know how to vote in all the other races on the constitutional questions on some of the ordinances that may be on the ballot. And you should also be aware that your ballot does not get um, thrown out if you don't vote in every uh, uh, spot where there's an opportunity for you to cast a, a, a choice one way or another. So your ballot doesn't get thrown out if you leave um, some races blank. However, I encourage you before you vote, get informed so that you vote the right way. To the question, um, uh, to my co-host and pastor, I think one thing that happens is when the president gets elected, they go to work. And oftentimes um, uh, not enough energy and time is spent on keeping people bought along with you so that they can help you deliver on the agenda that you're trying to provide. Uh, every Good. one of us, the moment you should do it now, but the moment she's elected should subscribe to the White House's uh, newsletter. Mm -hmm. They should subscribe. It, they, they produce it. They produce talking points. They produce the calendar every day of what's happening with senior administration officials. So it, it isn't like that doesn't exist. It does exist. We have to be good citizens. Go get it by simply putting our name on the list and letting that information come to us. You know what, guys? I don't think there is a perfect response to this because you'll recall Obama created after his election initially, mm -hmm. uh, used OFA as his organizing tool to keep people engaged through the election. Um, they had more money dedicated toward that thing than a little bit to, to power the people to be behind the president. And even that, 
didn't meet the expectations of many Americans right. who said, I felt abandoned after the election. Well, guess what? Yeah. This democracy requires that we do something to be part of it. It isn't that the apparatus didn't exist. It existed. How many of us plugged into it, stayed ignited around it? And the truth is, is all of us lose momentum after election. It sucks a lot out of us. But I got to say, yeah. if there was a time for us to engage beyond just the election cycle, that time is now. Kamala Harris will not be able to deliver on her agenda and a divided government unless we got people in the streets, people in neighborhoods and communities that are walking, canvassing, keeping their neighbors organized and aware of what's happening so that we can then demand the promises that were made, demand on them. But the absence of that, y'all, we've got little chance of seeing the kinds of results that I think we've loaded onto her and onto leadership without us having her back. And it's not just in social media, but in actual canvassing, door-to-door um, information sharing operations um, that many of us have engaged in so far in this election. We got to keep that going. Yeah. Andrew, I, to your point, uh, that's, you said after the election, Kamala Harris has got to go straight to work. And that is the disconnect between Donald yeah. Trump, who lives for that's rallies. Right. He doesn't want to do the work. He, he wants to be at the after right. party. Uh, and so he has spent four years doing rallies. Uh, and so now a week, five days before the election, we still don't have a plan. Concepts, though. Concepts. Concepts. We have the concept of a plan uh, because it's not really about going to work. It's uh, come on, meet me it's at this airport. Jail, yeah. He's trying to stay out of jail. Right. And speaking of power conceding, nothing without demand, Pastor, which we talk about all the time. We have another question that I think is important because on this show, we engage in nuance. Hi, Native Land Pod. My name is Carrington and I'm from Dallas, Texas. So there's been a lot of debates about Palestinian protesters coming to Democratic campaign rallies, specifically VP Harris's campaign rallies and disrupting. I am a campaign staffer and I've seen this head on and I wanted to know what are y'all's thoughts because I'm not too sure if this is the most effective strategy to tackle this issue, but I'm also an advocate for human rights and I do stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, another question is what can I do as a person who's passionate about politics, but also passionate about human rights and social justice? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And also, if you know any jobs that I should apply for on the Hill post-election day, please let me know. Thank you. As they say, close mouths. Go to yes. <laughs> Harrington's future is bright Very. because she ain't afraid I mean, to... Um, to 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 demand. Yeah. Oh yeah, power concedes nothing without a demand. I love that she, um, at a young age, clearly can hold space for Palestinians and still know that ain't but one option mm -hmm. on this ticket. Right, that I think is 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 remarkable for someone, um, at her age. And I do think it's it's a good question. Yeah. Has is this strategy effective? And if like we have been we've been in solidarity, not just in speech, but also in our in our actions, um, co-hosts um, and pastor with the Palestinian people. I wonder what is what what is the path forward? Because we know that what is happening over there cannot continue. And I cannot imagine if I had a relative there. I say this all the time. I would be a fool. I don't know what ledge y'all would have to talk me off of. Yeah. No. You when, know? when you look at the fact that both sides have been doing better tap dancing than Sammy Davis hmm. Jr., uh, is they have to really bowl right down the center aisle. Uh, at the DNC convention, uh, they had to uh, really make their voices heard. Imagine if there was no disruption, mm -hmm. yeah. how much Come more on. would have gone forward. I think a data just came out from the New York Times that 82% of uh, the destruction and the bombs that have gone off and the chaos, American taxpayers have mm -hmm. paid for. Uh, and oh, so geez. if we haven't been sounding the alarm, the carnage uh, would be that much deeper and greater. One of the handicaps we had, Tiffany, with uh, President Obama's presidency is black people were in a crosshair on how do you protest Pharaoh when he looks mm -hmm. like you. Uh, so when it is that we wanted to call him out on certain issues, we were seen as uh, sellouts. Yep. Uh, don't say anything. Yep. Uh, and I think that uh, we've got to learn from it that we put policy over personality. I mm -hmm. uh, realize that even while it is that I like you, I love you enough to That's challenge right. you. 
Yes. Uh, and I think that that's our responsibility. I, also, I, I love that. And I also think she, these protesters are going where they feel that their voices still may be heard, where they still may yeah. make a breakthrough. For many of us, we're saying we are allied with you because we believe in human rights. But for them, it's like, forget human rights. I'm talking about my cousin mm-hmm. and my aunt yeah. and my mother's sister and my uncle. And it, it, it is so much, it's so much more deeply personal that. I don't feel like any of us have the prerogative to direct how they ought to vote and how they ought to show up in American politics. I think their fight ought to be anywhere they can wage it, anywhere they can get in range of somebody being on the other side with a listening ear. They ought to make their demands and and, and whomever and, and they are making them to ought, to ought to desensitize themselves to it being an attack on you and moreover an attack on what you now represent, which is an institution, is as a system. Kamala Harris, if elected, will be at the helm of the United States government. And that means everything that yes. flows from that table, everything she will bear some responsibility for, she and her administration, because the Supreme Court has ruled that the executive branch exists of a leader of one, the president of the United mm. States. That's the only place where that is true. Uh, between the three branches, the judiciary is split between the nine justices. The the Congress is split, is split between 435 in the House and another 100 in the Senate. The executive is one, according to the law interpreted by this court. And and, and so she'll have to answer for it. And, and she becomes, again, the helm, the representative voice of an institution and, of course, the most powerful nation in the world. T- Tiffany, to go back to your political violence. Uh, and I want to go back two segments on what we raised about uh, Madison Square Garden. We cannot give a pass to Rudy Giuliani, uh, yeah. no. who got to the mic uh, and vilified two-year-olds. Mm-hmm. Uh, they said two-year-olds can't come in the country because two-year-olds are trained assassins when they just learning to tie their shoes. Uh, and so I think in the backlash of that kind of vitriol, uh, that you've got to be disruptive. Uh, but uh, my only issue that I want to stand with uh, my dear sister from Texas is that I think is the imbalance if you're only doing those disruptions at the Democratic mm-hmm. Party, uh, but not doing any of that at the Republican rallies. I think that it's got to be fair. It's got to be balanced uh, because their language uh, is 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 very threatening. That's to Andrew's time. point, though. They know where they can go. If they go to a oh, yeah. side where Tiffany state. played at earlier, stake. their lives literally are literally at stake. at stake going to those rallies. Yeah. The violence, then people saying that uh, Islam is not a religion. They don't see their humanity. Islam. Islam. And they were wearing see their t-shirts humanity. Huh? that said F Islam. That said F Islam, yeah. yeah. Well, That's right. I, oh, go ahead, Andrew. Um, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, well, no, no. I just wanted to respond really quickly because she was asking if it was effective. And I just want to say, Andrew, I really appreciate your point about saying like that's their cousin. That's somebody they know. And I got to say, if a government was funding the killing of my people who look like me, who I'm related to, who I can touch, who I email, who I text, these are real life people. We're looking at soon crossing over 50,000 people, mostly women and children, Good and they're grief. being silenced here in America. And if you look at Western media, it's a very specific narrative um, that is not always accurately portraying what is happening over there. Brown University uh, right here in America just suspended um, its chapter of students um, for for justice for uh, Palestine. The students are saying it is a politically motivated um, act on behalf of the university. We've seen across college campuses everywhere. So when you're being silenced, you, you deserve to be heard. So I... So if, if that is where they can be heard, I think Vice President Harris handled it very well um, this mm-hmm. week when, when she was disrupted and she said, hey, hey, guys, I hear you and, and address them. I like her handling it that way. It's not a good idea to eject people or reject what they're feeling or deny their experience. Um, and she has this is a real issue. And we just got to be honest about this. She has a real issue with um, the Arab community around Gaza. And it, it seems like a, a, a yeah. small solution to call for an immediate permanent ceasefire. Um, and so I think as much as they can be heard, we we support that for sure. And I also just want to point out that this week, Donald Trump um, insulted Michelle Obama for the first time. It's like he's known better before, but now he's come out and called her nasty, really because she got the better of him and he's a child. Um, but he insulted her this week. So I think this level of, of vitriol that's coming, if they, the, the saying about if we don't say anything for Palestinians, when they come for us, we have that's to right. speak up. They have to become we. 
we have to become us. Yeah. When you harm somebody, we stand on the side of goodness and righteousness. So and Donald I Trump's thank her America for her question. is clear that there's always another. Yes. They're, they're, for, because, because their grievance, that is their politics now. Grievance is their politics. We're not hearing plans. Nobody's talking about going and voting for him because of his position on X, Y, and Z and, and, and such and such. It, it's, it's the fact that the, their politics is now the co- politics of complaint yeah. and that there's always another or an other that's responsible for whatever injury that you happen to be feeling. And for a party that used to talk about bootstraps and, and, and strength and so on, I mean, I've never seen a weaker version of themselves than I have in, in, in these that last is, several years of politics. It is, is very, very, very weak. Um, yeah. And I think unrepresentative of, of what they tout about who they are. Yeah, well, we are at the end of our show. We always have calls to Pastor action. Pastor got to give one. Don't let um, him off without giving one. Oh, no, he going to okay. go first. So we have calls to action at the end of every episode, Pastor Jamal Harrison Bryant. So what do you have for us? What's our call to action this week? My call to action is every relative you have, I need you to blow That's up the it. phone. I want you to send all of them to rides to vote. Dot com rides to vote dot com. We've got free Uber rides for everybody to get to your polling station. I don't want you to have any excuse. You don't have to hitchhike. You ain't got to catch two <laughs> buses. You can get an Uber to the polls. I need you to go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. And as we said, don't just uh, vote at the top of the ticket, uh, but vote all the way down and read the pieces of legislation that are on the ballot for your state and for your region, many of them about museums and about schools and about uh, funding uh, different uh, areas. And so if you really want to be involved, educate yourself. Angela and I are alumnus of the NAACP. Mega Evers gave us the blueprint and said, voter education, voter registration, get out to vote. I don't want you to just go out and vote. I want you to know what you're voting Mm -hmm. for and what it's about. The people are clear that our people are dying from a lack of knowledge. So find out before you go to the polls. Love it. Very good. I have two. Um, One, you know, since we got the pastor in the house, I want to shout out everybody who goes to Bible study on Wednesdays. That was that's when our church used to do (laughs) Bible study. And since we talked about two Corinthians earlier, I want to talk about Second Timothy one and seven, where it says that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love and of, of a sound mind. So if you go to a rally and you see a whole lot of fear talk. Yes. Okay. So now I just want to go over here to um, shout out Black Voters Matter. Um, We're going to be with them a few more times before Election Day. We have three, say with me, three live shows coming up. We will be in Tallahassee this Friday for Andrew's homecoming at Florida A&M University. Oh, Tim, strike, strike, strike again. Strike, strike, strike again. Yep. Strike, strike, do it again. Strike, 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 strike okay, again. Th- th- this time I thought she went like this. No, I was like, but what who is this? You lost a finger. You a froze. Panther. I can't see. It's oh, <laughs> that's a schizophrenic cat. Anyway, oh, go Lord, ahead. Mercy. Oh, Jesus, Lord, mercy. Oh, Lord. Yeah, y'all turn, make sure you turn into that. We won't say the name of that episode because the pastor is here. Um, but also, we are going to be in Philadelphia on Monday, and we will be um, at Howard University on Tuesday with our good brother, Lenar. We are going to do a joint Breakfast Club, Native Land Pod, live election day, um, hopefully history making election day where the voter turnout is so great they can't even stop you with a provisional ballot not counted. So, yes, go out and vote. Say the website for us one more time. Rides to vote dot com. Ask that you'll please go spread it everywhere and a call to action. Oh, I want to. I want to. I got to. I got to do it. I got to invite Tiffany. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Tiffany, I got to do it. And th- those of you who don't we go coming. to church, I, I, I cannot, I cannot go out That's a good one. without inviting Tiffany to come to church. And those of you who don't go to church Can in that great number. Yes, please okay, we come. Going, Andrew. I want you to come. And those of you who don't feel comfortable coming to church, stream us. Uh, go to newbirth.org. And your podcast. And the podcast. Let's Be Clear. Let's What's be the next clear. episode drop? Today when, or it, tomorrow? Tomorrow. Next episode drops same day as he going to be on two podcasts yes. tomorrow. All yes. right. Well, today. Today. Cause it's and today I want now. y'all to come on my I'd podcast. Love to. Yes. Love to. Would love to. Yeah. Andrew and Tiff, Tiff, you guys got coming. Me and Tiffany are doing one live from church. Oh, Tiff, he said y'all doing one live from church. I love that. <laughs> okay. Well, my call to action is not political. Um, I, okay. so you all just heard Angela go over our schedule. She be messing up my travel all the time. Okay. So I'm getting off Ooh. my flight. Uh, where were we? 
Atlanta. Um, so pray. Where is this going? I'm nervous. I'm, this is my call to action. I think I told you what happened oh, is, but I want the viewers to know. So anyway, okay. Pastor Bryant, I'm getting off the plane and I need to <laughs> rearrange my whole travel. Okay. And so I'm like, I don't have time. Let me just Google Amex travel. And I uh, just hit call Amex travel and I'm on the phone and honey, I didn't give these people the key to my whole life. They're like, we need to verify your account number. We need to verify your security number. Do y'all know I was not talking to Amex travel? Somebody then bought the website and it, like it's a weird website and it's slightly wow. off. You got to watch. And I gave these people everything. And the thing that made me spidey, gave my spidey senses, like five, they had me on hold for like five minutes. And I'm like, Amex wouldn't have me on hold that long. Not with mm-hmm. these big ass balances I carry. Somebody better get on this call in 10 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> and I hung up and I had to call Amex and tell them. So my call to action is. These scammers are getting good and better and tighter. They, they didn't are. get anything from me, and Amex was able to, you know, just say, oh, Shut it let's, down. Yeah, they shut it down. Um, but I, if I heard this story, I would have thought, oh, that wouldn't happen to me. And I'm telling y'all, it happened to me. They almost got me, but they didn't. So just be careful on... But yes. God. So be careful on how you, uh, how, 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 what information you give and how you're verify that you're talking to the correct person. That's my CTA. My testimony, my thankfulness, and my CTA. <laughs> my call to action is uh, a, a repeat, but directly, specifically targeting Florida voters. If you are a Florida voter, a Democrat in Florida, and you haven't voted yet, please do so ASAP. Republicans are outpacing Democrats uh, quite significantly in early vote and and absentee vote. That has not always been the case in 2018. Democrats outpaced Republicans by that matrix. And so if you're in the state of Florida, there are serious issues, questions on the ballot to include the legalization of marijuana, to include the codification of Roe um, in the state's constitution, protecting a woman's right to make her own reproductive health decisions. Um, and a number of local issues that are too numerous to name. Uh, but I know Republicans have done an incredible job at beating the spirit out of us, of, 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 of sitting on our backs and constricting our breathing and in every single way trying to uh, force us out of the system. Um, but we make that job easier when we, when we choose not to participate. So uh, you're in Florida. It really is for everywhere. But I want to admonish my state particularly uh, to get out and vote because um, five days before the final day of election day, uh, we ain't looking so great. So let's get those numbers up. That's it. Well, this is episode 49. Like we said, we got five days. We got five on it till election day. Make sure you take five people yes. with you and um, only vote one time. But five people. <laughs> but please make sure you take five Five people with you or more than that. Uh, before we end the show, I want to remind everyone to leave us a review and subscribe to Native Land Pod. We're available on all platforms and YouTube. Nip- new episodes drop every Thursday. You can also follow us on social media. We are Angela Rye, Tiffany Cross, and Andrew Gillum. And our guest host yeah, yeah. today. Thank just you, Pastor yeah, yeah. But you know we have a pastor in the building. Jamal Harrison <laughs> Bryant. It was from great. New Birth Missionary Church. Missionary Baptist Church. I yes, messed up. I left it. off the Baptist. You did it. But he was AME first. Yes. And he was an NAACP at the same time as AME. Okay, I'm done. All right, I'm done. But we are Thank so happy. Pastor. It was great, no, I'm Pastor. glad to let y'all rock we with me. We love having you on. I'm this was grateful. great. Thank you for joining the natives. Intentional with the info on all of the latest. Rod Gillum and Cross connected to the statements that you leave on our socials. Thank you sincerely for the patience. Reason for your choice is clear. We're so grateful. We're Took the oath to execute roles. Yeah, faithful. Preserve, defend, and protect the truth. Even if painful. Welcome home to all of the natives. We thank you. Welcome home, y'all. What's Welcome up, home. Sis? Native Land Pod is a production of iHeartRadio in partnership with Reason Choice Media. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.